Yeah. So, thank you very much for attending. Uh, I'm Colin Modry. I'm a consultant at Semaku. Uh, Semaku is a consulting and uh, software development company based in the Netherlands. Uh, our primary domains are content uh, management and uh, product information management. We basically see them as a this probably should be managed more as common uh, information sets are a really drastically different documentation set, different information sets. So, but today I'm going to uh, present a project that I've uh, been developing in the past year uh, on my own. So of course I've uh, heavily used my experience as a consultant uh, with Semaco customers, but uh, this is a, yeah, a project I do on my own open source and, uh, and, uh, and basically I'm presenting it today to get some feedback from you, uh, see how you see it fit for maybe possible use in your company or if you, if it's, uh, if you see that's almost it but you see room for improvement. Um, I gave a similar presentation last year, uh, maybe some of you saw it, uh, where I introduced the directions I was taking and this time I will definitely show you actual uh, practical uses, uh, both uh, at, one our, at one of our clients, NXP Semiconductors, and also some uh, data point toolkit plugin that you can use uh, uh, yourself to explore your data and metadata, and uh, hopefully find uh, nice insights in it. So, uh, the key technology behind this project is RDF. RDF is a, is a W3C standard that was born uh, nearly at the same time as XML at the end of the 90s. It uh, was championed by Tim Berners-Lee, who is the inverter of the World World Web, and uh, used by companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, Volkswagen, and so on, many companies. Um, as a user, you almost never see really that it's used in the back end, but for example, for Facebook, it's uh, what uh, fuels the Facebook graph search. That's how you can type very fancy uh, queries like who are my friends who, lives in, who live in India, and it will understand this, this question. And uh, Google uses it for its uh, knowledge graph to show you nice Wikipedia extracts uh, when you do a search in there, so search engine. So it's, yeah, it's really adopted in production by serious companies. And uh, I will show you, to, give, yeah, to make you, help you to understand what it is, by explaining how it completes XML. It doesn't replace it, it really completes it. It's, uh, so here is a typical XML file. Uh, that's an XML file that's, that's pur the purpose is to describe a family. So there is a person called Colin, who has a mother called Sarah, and a father called Felix. And um, so they are uh, nicely nested in a tree structure. Um, so you all know that. One of the limitations in here is, uh, for example, if the mother Sarah is also a, like a sister of someone, or a cousin, or an aunt, then you're kind of limited in the way you can uh, uh, arrange your XML file to uh, to express these relationships. Um, one way, and that's what DITA does in a certain extent, to, re to represent like more complex relationships between elements in the content, is to uh, go more to a flat structure where things have identifiers and creating references between the elements. So in DITA we have cross-references, conref, topic refs, while for a family we would have a flat list of persons with references to another person. And this way, yeah, it's very, very flexible. You could in, uh, express all the, uh, the relationships you want. Um, however, uh, you're not using XML as a tree, and as a consequence, the performance uh, while query will be very poor because every time you need to parse the whole data to find uh, what you're looking for. So. This is where we find the limitations of XML and where uh, RDF comes to the rescue. Because RDF 
uh, contrary to XML, which is a tree data model, RDF expresses uh, graph structures. Uh, so a graph, uh, well, you see one here. Uh, so we come back to our example of a family. A graph basically is made of nodes and qualified relationships. And uh, so in RDF, we, we are able to express such information, uh, having people connected in various ways. Uh, and so a person can be a known, a brother, a son, a father, depending on who they are related to. So if you use this, for, start thinking like this for your products or for your documentation, then it opens a lot of possibilities in terms of uh, how you represent information and um, and we will see later how you can also retrieve information uh, from this graph. So RDF is a graph data model. Um, so at our clients uh, NXP semiconductors, we have uh, in the past two years we've been implemented RDF. We've been implementing RDF. The main purpose was to uh, break the existing silos of data, uh, whether it is product information or document information. Uh, it could be data, metadata, or metadata about published documents in PDF or images. And the limitations we had is that this information was all in silos, separated, and every time we wanted to make them communicate, we needed to develop uh, custom APIs that we have to maintain ourselves, highly customized, and uh, yeah, too much work. We ended up with a kind of web of APIs um, that didn't, was not scalable. So we're looking for a technology that enable uh, the creation of a corporate graph, and uh, RDF being a standard was the obvious choice, and so we made that. So we described, we extracted, so we didn't change our silos, so we still keep kept using the same solutions for, to manage our information. So our CMS is the same, CCMS is the same, the product information management is the same tool. But we created extractors to extract the metadata as RDF and uh, to populate it in a central repository. So we did for documents, for products, for groups of products, and for divisions in the company. Uh, departments, uh, so it's a semiconductor company that have broad range of uh, different products, come diodes, microprocessors, and so on. So we can see each branch and sub-branch as a group of people. And we express the actual relationships in real life that, are, uh, that connect these entities in our uh, corporate graph. So before, these uh, relations only existed in people's mind. They knew, oh yeah, this product belongs to that uh, uh, division because there is, that's their identifier. But the identifier might not be normalized or across the company. It was very loosely uh, connected. So now we have actual connect, uh, connection that we can query, that we can, and uh, from which we can build apps and explore this data. It's very helpful uh, for decision making and having a good overview of what's going on. I will uh, show you some examples of applications that were built using this data. The first one uh, is a product tree manager. So NXP manages their uh, product offering by, uh, according to two kind of taxonomies, product by function, where we split by uh, amplifiers, well, what the product does. And another one is product by application, where in which area the product is useful can be, I don't know, defense, uh, satellites, uh, white products. Anyway, the point is we made this tool to manage the, the tree and drag and drop uh, the different product categories uh, to nest them. We can replicate a category to another place of the tree. So it's not duplicated, it's the same. It's just located at different points of the tree and for which we can edit the, the the description. The cool thing here is that we didn't develop it. Well, we improved it a bit, but it was basically off the shelf an open source tool to manage uh, trees as RDF, simply like that. So we saved a lot of time uh, in development. This is kind of the tool that comes next to it. 
It's, uh, so the previous tool was managing the branches of the tree. This one uh, organizes the leaves of the tree, so the actual products and where they are located in the tree. Um, so we search for a product and we assign it to different categories. Uh, the nice thing here is that the, the data is updated live, so as soon as I click on the cross, red cross here, it will uh, remove the product from this category and this will be uh, yeah, updated all across the, the, the company. Not on the website, there's a bit of latency still, but it really made basically people looking at the same data in real time, something that's uh, up to date and um, so that brought a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, like marketeers and sales were really happy to have something that, where you edit something, it's visible directly, not on the website, but at least internally. So this is uses the, yeah, it uses tree data, product lifecycle management data, product data, documentation to fill some short product description. So this is something that before would have been very complicated to, to merge because it was coming from so different uh, data sources. But in, with RDF, because it was already populated in the same metadata cloud, we were able to make an app out of it uh, very easily. I mean, compared with all the applications we were making in the past. I hope I'm speaking too fast. <laughs> I think it's good. Um, fourth appli uh, third application, uh, we made a data-driven transition process. Um, so I just wrote a script that queries the, this cloud of metadata and retrieves all the data content that's linked both at a category level, so for example micro microcontrollers, and retrieves the data content that is connected to all the nodes that are below, so groups of products and products themselves. This gives me the URL of the data content, which enables me to download it, so all this the script does automatically. Uh, it groups them by company division, because we want to yeah, split the bill for the translation cost. So this way we can have a word count for each company division. This was uh, quite uh, a big improvement compared with the past because the division, of the products in the tree, are, I mean, the tree doesn't represent how the products are owned or the group of products are owned within the company. It's completely a different uh, uh, distribution. So having this, having the possibility to group the content by company division was really a big, big improvement compared to the past. We uh, upload the, this uh, packages of, of, of data content to the transition management system, which makes the word count and so on. So from then on, the transition process starts. So in total, uh, five minutes. So that includes uh, entering the command line and waiting basically for the download and upload. So if for a very big category, maybe but might be between uh, five and 10 minutes, depending on how much content there is to download, but basically you can go for a coffee and it's doing the work for you. And um, as bonus, we, we got, uh, we were able to retrieve detailed statistics on which branches were translated when, which content uh, was translated or outdated and so on. So very good also to, to have an overview of what has to be translated and, and what not. So this uses data from the tree of uh, products, from documentation, so a lot of details about the data content and about the <coughs> divisions to share the bill for the translation. And the last one is a kind of all-around browsing tool called uh, Information Panorama. It relies on an open source uh, brick used for to browse graph data called Graffiti and uh, we made a sort of search, internal search engine that searches across all the data we have in our metadata cloud and for each shows a sort of a yeah, detailed view of what the thing is, uh, if it has a picture then we get a picture and uh, outbound and inbound links, so which things refer to that thing, <coughs> for example for a product, which documents are linked to this product and which categories of products this product belongs to. So very useful also to uh, 
when we have data issues to debug them and understanding what, what, what went wrong. So, all these uh, <coughs> nice applications uh, draw the necessity to uh, process the data content in a very yeah, smart way, smarter way, and uh, as much as possible making it standard. So, using the Depon toolkit made complete sense to make the uh, to create the RDF content from metadata from data content. So the DR, yeah. So the DR RDF project uh, encompasses several components, several uh, deliver, several deliverables. Sorry. So it has a translation of the data language reference in RDF in the RDF way. So as a graph instead of uh, DTDs and schemas. Uh, data Topon Toolkit plugin, which is the core element to enable to the RDF extraction. I provide some Sparkle queries. So Sparkle is the query language for RDF that uh, the users can, well, you can uh, use to query uh, your data metadata and get some yeah, information like statistics. And finally, uh, the Darwin browser, I call it like called Darwin Information Topic Architecture. So the Darwin browser is a web app uh, to browse the data metadata. That, and I will show you show it to you in a second. Um, yeah. So how? Yes. Exactly, the Darwin browser is a way of, to explore this data. Uh, it's not final yet. Well, it will maybe never be, but the, what I prepared for today is a more sort of tro prototype. So it's definitely usable and already can be very helpful to um, understand what data you have, what, what, what your metadata, metadata you have in your data content. But yeah, I will show you later. There, there are a lot, there's a lot of room for improvement. So, uh, works quite as much as like uh, any uh, content processing with data and toolkit. You have your data content, you have your data and toolkit, to which, in which you install the data to RDF plugin, like you would install any data open toolkit plugin. And uh, the new thing here is that you have an RDF repository on your computer or remote. Um, I chose this one, Apache Mamota, uh, well, because it comes from Apache, so very standard team behind it, and also because it has a very user-friendly installer, so you download it, you double-click, you click OK twice, and it's set up more or less. Um, so very easy to install. So you run the, the transformation in your data map, or your root data map, from which you want to extract uh, data metadata, and it will create an RDF file that will be uploaded to your RDF repository. It's sort of a database for RDF. And to also output HTML that will build the Darwin browser. And when it works, the Darwin browser, you, uh, it queries the repository to get, well, you will see, to display some uh, graphs and tables to indicate you a bit what's in your content. Um, I think it's time to show if it works. Yeah. Um, so here I'm in the data open toolkit uh, command line. Um, any trans type or, or processing scenario, like PDF2. So, and uh, trans type. So, the plugin creates a new transtab RDF. Oh, actually, I stored it. <laughs> so transtab RDF. Uh, I put the args input as my the data map I want to use as input. And I, yeah, I had. And I also added a parameter that it doesn't build the browser right now. Uh, the reason for this is that I have already uh, stored several maps in the repository and building the browser would take two or three minutes, so I, I will just uh, skip it and let's go. 
So here we have the pre-processing, it uploads to the repository, and that's all. So normally, if I didn't add the, the parameter to skip the browser, at the end, it would generate the HTML to browse, but it, I generated before. Uh, so to save time, we'll, we'll skip it. Um, just to give you an idea, to show you it's a very normal plugin, nothing very special. Um, so it starts very normally with the typical lit up and toolkit steps. Um, the pre-processing is quite quick because I removed some of the steps that were not useful in this context. So I won't, yeah, I don't, I don't remember the exact list of steps that were removed, that I removed. But basically, I only generate a list of files, uh, apply filtering. So if you use a ditaval, you can. It filters the content. And it will resolve the key references. And then finally, uh, with this kind of resolve data content, it will transform with XSLT the data content to RDF. And then as the output, you get several things. Oh, you're probably not see, but I will show you. So you, you get one folder that contains the files for the browser, and you get one RDF file um, that contains all the metadata uh, as being a graph model. Uh, I could well, I could open it actually. So it's XML, uh, so it's, uh, RDF has several uh, civilizations that are possible, XML is one of them, um, and uh, there is also one in JSON. So this XML is purely mean, meant to, as a transport medium uh, to import RDF or export it between two repositories. It's not meant to be used like as XML because um, here we would have the same limitations as in XML, it would just be a tree with a lot of references. But uh, so here we only use XML, this RDF XML as a transport file uh, to be imported in an RDF repository. And it's in the repository that you really you get the full uh, benefits of RDF, not as a file like that. So I will show you the browser. Everything. So I used, uh, I hope they don't mind, I used a few sample data content from Oxygen and uh, the Data Open Toolkit User Guide and the documentation of the Data RDF project, which is written in Data. So the home page of the tool uh, lists the maps from which you have extracted the metadata and with the extraction time and the title of the map. Uh, I call them context. You could also call them uh, scopes or root maps. The, the meaning behind this is basically you have a, a root map and it, and it gets, gathers all the metadata that, it, that describes the content that, it's, that is uh, related to it uh, more or less directly. So it, it will get the metadata of all the content that is connected to it, whether uh, by topic references, cross references. So it really follows all the relationships and uh, to create a kind of uh, yeah, graph, a, a documentation set. That will also be a way to call it. Let's look at uh, what the one we just extracted, the flowers. Um, so, this is the overview of this context. Uh, the, the first section is the list of maps in, within this context. Here we only have one data map. The second one is the graph that shows the yeah, visualization of the relations and the different components in this, in this, uh, in this context. Uh, this first, uh, the center, that's the map we use for input. And uh, then the blue lines, the blue arrows, are the related references to other topics on maps. Here we only have topic refs, 
we have a few link elements like between these two topics and um, we don't have cross references it doesn't it's only uh, cross file references so it doesn't include con content references or uh, yeah, it doesn't include con key ref or con refs. Um, yeah, this one isn't relevant here for this one. And the nice thing is that you can browse. So you click on the on the on one of the maps that are included in this context, and you get the list of all the child topics in this map. So topics are in yellow. Here we only have topics. You get the you it displays the type. So it's both a topic and a task because the task is a topic. Uh, the ID and the path, so the file path of this of the data file. And finally, we can open a topic. So for topics, there's there isn't much to see here except that you have the title, the ID, and the path of the file. And uh, here we have an inbound link. So that's a file here, a map in blue that refers to this topic. Um, let's see a more interesting example with more linking, the data control kit user guide. So here many maps. Um, we have a list of keys. So most of these are references. Um, I still need to work on the, the keys that re uh, refer to keywords because here you only have a keyword word, but it should be the, I don't know, uh, version of the Temple Toolkit or something like that. You have the location on the, on the right. So, okay, this is a bit crowded this time. <laughs> but it's there. <laughs> the flowers, it was more visible. And uh, the a list of link elements. Um, so this linked element, something I implemented last week, was uh, Elliot Kimber who requested that, or at least something very similar to this. So what it shows is a list of the things, so the elements, for example, a phrase or a, the elements that are being referenced to by a cross-reference or by a con -ref, con content reference, con -ref. and. At the right, you see a number, it, uh, it shows how many times it's referenced. So here, the, it's sorted by number of references, so the, at the top you get the most referenced one, and then going down and down and down, it's uh, less. So we can say that in the detailed point toolkit user guide, there is this element that is very popular, it's the change extension phrase, the, the ID is here, type of element, the text within this element, and the, here, the what is that? Ah, yeah, that's the title of uh, the topic or map that contains this element that is referenced very often. Here, uh, it should be text. Um, so yeah, very good to know which elements are very popular in the, your documentation set for reference. Um, let's look. Uh, yeah, I was looking for a, a map of or a topic which would have many inbound links, but I don't remember of one. But yeah, the same here. So we entered the map. Yeah, we entered the map, and here we have the list of topics, and here an inbound link, which is the root uh, data map for the Tapon Toolkit user guide. And again, basic metadata, title, ID, uh, the path of the data map, and its language. So this is how it is. Uh, that's the current status. Um, I will, I think, stop development on this version because it's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, from a div uh, web app point of view, it's very ugly. It creates one HTML file per thing, so it takes a lot, takes a lot of time to generate. It's not, it's only partly dynamic. So this is dynamically retrieved from the database, but these links are not. Uh, they are static, so if you update your content and re-export it, it will not be updated unless you regenerate all these HTML files. So the objective is to uh, respect more the standard of web app development 
and use a decent uh, front-end framework uh, and making it all dynamic. So that whenever you import new content in your repository, your application uh, takes it into account, you refresh and ta-da, it's updated. So it's not the case today, but it uh, will be for version 2 that I will start uh, very soon. I think it's all for the demonstration. So I think that's all. Yep, that's me and my graph. Thank you very much. <laughs> actually lists all the links, uh, cross-references, or congress, mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually tell you what it is, right? You, you, can, you, can you make out from this list whether it's a, actually a congress or a link? Um, so you mean, just to be sure, it was not a slide, it was a yeah, it browser, was a but uh, let's see, ah, it was I a think context. It was the main context where you had yeah. of maps. So you mean this list at the bottom? Yeah, correct. Right. So can you make out uh, whether this, uh, if this is a congrep or is a link to? No, okay. not here. Um, I didn't do that because I assume that here there is a lot of room for yeah, uh, maybe splitting the congrefs and the cross-reference into different tables. I wanted to show in general the, the, the elements that are mostly uh, linked to. Um, but yeah, no, it doesn't. It mixes up all, all the all It's demo. kind of what I like it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the, the, yeah, the, the question to be sure was that whether it, you can see whether it's these are congrefs or cross reference. But here it makes them all and count them all as, as a, just as a in, inbound reference. There was a question. Yeah, in the back. Uh, could you go to your demo where you show the flower? Yeah. So, since you were you were showing us how you're relating various stacks of data for your presentation, I was just wondering if you thought about if you get analytics, say, from a website or mm -hmm. a publication based on the data map, but for purposes of example, it looks something like this. Could you inject sort of your analytics so you can see what pages are being hit in terms of yeah. information architecture? Well, the point here is that there are two ways. I mean, either there is some sort of standard. So the question was uh, whether in this visualization or in this tool more generally, uh, you could see information about, for example, how popular is the document on your website, how many hits it gets, and if you could kind of see it in the same place. Well, here we're touching the, 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 the benefit of RDF. Is indeed, that yeah, you can cross the things together. Um, so as far as I know, and, and I haven't seen uh, people storing uh, web free, um, web statistics in RDF, nothing prevents it. Uh, from my point of view, I would do it if there is some sort of standard, uh, how to say, a standard way of doing that. Then I would then just need to look for something standard and it would connect. Um, there is not for web, uh, not for the web. Uh, statistics, but for the poll for to link a product to a document in general, there are quite standard uh, links you can make in your data that we we, we, we enable at NXP. And uh, if I see that there is a demand in that area, I would uh, most probably implement it too, because this is, this is I think one of the strong points of this uh, feature that RDF is trying to make. Talk yeah. About because once you have <coughs> your sort of representation of data in RDF, you can start. Exactly. Business cases. Yeah. From other sources, which yeah. are very hard to match up now. Well, it opens for sure a lot of possibilities now. Uh, this is something I do on my own time, so I'm not a software vendor on my own. My company is, but not me. So, um, I mean, if I did that, is to show uh, the software development company what is easy to make, how easy it is to, to make such application. I mean, I'm not a web developer, I have good knowledge of CSS, HTML, and XSLT. Uh, I do a bit of JavaScript, but that's not my job. And 
However, I was still able to do that. <laughs> so uh, if I was able to do that on my own on my free time, what can companies whose this is actually the job of dozens of developers could do uh, from that? Uh, I think it could be really cool. Uh, so this is basically saying, uh, yeah, this is easy. Please implement it uh, if you have questions about what the RDF looks like, how it works, how to query a repository. I'm all available for answering questions. Um, so I'm not, just for your question, I will not uh, really go very far in the implementation of specific, yeah, adding more data. I will focus on the data area because that's uh, what I know very well and uh, because I know the, uh, the ontology, the vocabulary that's behind it. But to extend it, I really would uh, ask the software vendor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what can I? Yeah, so there is a. Did I put the URL? Yeah, so you have the address of the product here. That's the address of the documentation that we will explain you uh, step by step how to get started. Um, the detail toolkit plugin part is probably very straightforward. Uh, I also explain how to set up the repository and uh, uh, really it's uh, actually to a few colleagues of mine at XP and they, they got it so I don't think it's uh, anyone who has been installing a plugin in the development toolkit can get started and explore their own uh, documents and, uh, and hopefully be happy <laughs> and make better decisions. Okay, more questions? Yes? Well, uh, I thought that maybe you could use a triple store that represents your data map to render data dynamically. Of course. Um, so then the, the other question is, would be what for? But Because uh, it would be pretty easy to add topics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have, def we have data, uh, data that looks like that is very close to data. Uh, a little uh, thing here, the purpose here is not to store data content. We only get the metadata. The natural language is not here. The strings are not there. However, we have the path of where the data map is, lo is located. So that could be... Uh, so you have, you have, you have, you have, you have URLs. You have resolved everything, so you have yeah. easy access to exactly. all the links. Exactly. And that's what we do at NXP Semiconductors, for example, for the translation process. Uh, we have a product that's linked to a data map. And uh, because this product is in the scope of the translation project, then it, it's connected to the data map and retrieves a URL, and we end up with a long list of URLs that we fetch, and we get uh, all the data content. So, yeah, it's, it, it would be really helpful to, it is very helpful to uh, retrieve data content and build uh, content somewhat dynamically. No more questions. Okay. And uh, thank you very much. And, um, I will, yeah, I will leave a few cards here. I have recorded the presentation, so I will upload it to YouTube. And uh, if you have yeah questions later that comes to your mind, please write. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.